He has spoken on the topics of faith, family and freedom in Cuba, Belgium, Brazil, Congo, UK and all over the USA to crowds from 14 to 40,000. International Leadership Speaker, Trainer and Coach Author of Learn to Raw Leadership, Attitude Hack, Live a More Excellent Life, 5 Battle Strategies of a Victorious Warrior. 2021 President's Lifetime Achievement Award Recipient. Founding Partner of the John Maxwell Team. Toastmaster International Speech Competition Semi-Finalist. Founder of Tell It Like It Is TV, ThatGuyRocks.com and ThatGuySpeaks.com. Creator of Story Power TV, Transforming Grace TV, and Leading Leaders Podcast. Producer of four TV programs and podcasts for Liftable TV and World Trumpet Television as well as multiple social media channels. Please help me welcome J. Lauren Norris. Have you ever been prompted to say, that's not the way I remember it. That is not exactly what happened. I was there and that's not what I saw. I grew up redneck. I remember the day one of my hunting buddies decided to charge forward into the field shooting at some quail. And as they were ruffling up out of the grass, he fired a couple of shots and then he stood up to take a couple more shots. And one of the guys who didn't charge forward decided to shoot at the same quail, literally blew the man's ball cap off his head. Thank God it was just his hat. Now it was a red hat and so we all freaked out a minute, but he only had a couple of scrapes from the pellets that took his hat off. Well, that's how I remember it. Were you there? Or do you just have to trust what I saw? That's what I want to talk about in this episode of Leading Leaders. Stay tuned. Subscribe now for our extensive video library of leadership lessons promoting faith, family, and freedom. I'm Jay Lauren Norris with Leading Leaders Podcast. And yes, I know you weren't there. Well, maybe you were. There were about five of us. I know a couple of them have gone on to the uh, other side of the Rainbow Bridge, so to speak. And uh, others of them, well, they probably don't watch this podcast. But that's the way I recall it. I was about 15, maybe 16 years old when it happened. And so there's a, a lot of days under the bridge between then and now. But see, there are things that happened in history that, well, I wouldn't know about them at all, except that I have, well, I have, I have this library, but that's like one third of my library. It goes all the way down that wall. It's double stacked. It's stacked on top because I... Well, I don't have enough room for all the books that I have. In fact, in my office in the next room, there are still boxes of books. And in my storage unit, boxes of books, at least two dozen more boxes of books. I could complete this entire room with bookshelves and not have enough room for all the books that I have. And yet yesterday, yesterday, I learned two new things about history that I did not know. One of them, very recent history, that there's a group who does a thing similar to what I was, I believe, called to do in October of 2018. And I've been very slow getting it done. But what I was called to do was to collect a bunch of stories. In fact, part of what I felt like I was led to do was to, to get people on a stage, give them a microphone and just let them say what they wanted to say. In fact, I can see the banner right now in my office. It's a six by six banner designed to go on the back of the stage, on the back of our, what we call the bus. So that when people step on that stage and hold a microphone, it says First Amendment Tour. Right there on it. So every video has them in it. So they can take advantage of the First Amendment, speak their mind, say their piece, and be broadcast through the various platforms that we have. And I didn't realize that since 2005, another organization has been doing the same thing. In fact, they're ahead of me in that they already have their mobile camper already built out with a studio in it. They've been dragging it around the country, stopping in various places and recording stories and interviews of people. They have hundreds of thousands of these stories already. They're way ahead of me. It was a little disconcerting when I realized somebody already had my plan and they were already executing on it and I'm way behind the gun. It's also ironic that I would be given that assignment in 2018 if they've been working on this since 2005. Do we really need two people doing this? 
And then I began to look at the sources of their funding. And I began to ask myself the question, would they gather, collect, and record the same stories that I would? I'm going to put a pause button on that thought for a moment and tell you about the other piece of history that I discovered yesterday. I overheard a conversation. Actually, it was a podcast, so I was supposed to be overhearing. It wasn't like I was eavesdropping. I was listening to a podcast. And in this podcast, one of the hosts of the show said, have you ever heard of the Four Minute Men? Back during the World War I, when they needed bonds and they needed help and they needed you know, don't eat all the food that we have because we have limited supply and we're about to send men to war. And back in the day before we sent drones with pilots sitting in comfy little, you know, hotels in the mountains of Colorado and blowing up people in Afghanistan. Long before that day, if we went to war, we actually sent our teenage boys with guns in their hands to get shot at and to fight with bayonets. And in World War I, that's exactly what they were asking for. Give us your teenagers, give us your bonds, give us your funds, don't eat all the food, we still have to feed them. And oh, by the way, help us make the things that allow us to go to war. Well, the idea was that there were a whole lot of people not so hip on the idea of going to war, but they were already busy living their lives in 1916, 17, 18, 19. And so they were really busy about going about their lives and, and just living every day of life. And they would go to the movie theater. And the information specialists of the day, a guy by the name of Creel, discovered that the amount of time it takes to take the movie reel off of the projector and set it aside and put another one up there was exactly four minutes. Which meant for every movie theater in America, where American citizens, everyday Joes and Janes, were gathering to watch these movies, there was four minutes of time not yet being consumed by anything else four minutes to save the world. Four minutes, just four, just four minutes. And so the idea was, let's prepare a canned message. Let's prepare a canned message that specifically fits in a four minute window. And let's deploy some volunteers who will go into these movie theaters auspiciously as guest movie goers, regular audience members, but in that four minute window, they will pop up and recite exactly what we tell them to. And I've heard some of those poems that were recited, some of those pieces of information that were delivered. And some of them are, well, they're very dis cleverly disguised propaganda. Ironically, though, they didn't call it disguised propaganda. They, well, they called it propaganda because they knew that's what it was. They just said it straight out. This is not a misinformation campaign. This is a get you to do what we want you to campaign. They talked about how vicious the enemy was and the terrible things they would do to our young men and women, the terrible things they would do to our women and children if they made it across the pond onto our own soil. They talked about the things they would do and even talked about, quote, the right to tax the American citizen if they didn't voluntarily give the loan to fund the War Department. It's in the propaganda. Go back and look for the text. You'll find it. If Uncle Sam doesn't get the loan that he's asking for from you voluntarily, he will come take it from you because it's his right. Okay, that's not in the Constitution. In fact, it's, it, it's nowhere. It, it's not a law. There is no law that says that you have to give income tax. It's, it's not there. Uh, there's policies, but we don't have law, uh, policy enforcement officers. We have law enforcement officers. IRS has code enforcement people, but they're not law enforcement. They're code enforcement. Those are different. Do some homework. But see, here's, here's really my point, that, that when you have people who are trained and equipped to influence, to communicate, they can be deployed as leaders, as everyday Joes and Janes as social media influencers. They can stand up in front of the movie house while the film is being changed from one reel to another. They can, they can walk down the street, they can send a tweet. And they can influence decisions. Decisions made in the courthouse. Decisions made in the White House. Decisions made in your house. And see, every leader that you know who is a storyteller probably has read some history and they know that history, well, 
history is one of the spoils of the victor. Please do not let that statement slide by you as just another phrase or turn of phrase. History is the spoil of the victor. Whoever wins the war gets to write the history. Think again to the analogy I've used a thousand times. Five people standing on a street corner, eyewitness to an accident. When the report comes out, those five people will tell nine different stories. Why? Well, because all of them have their own perspective about who did it, whose fault was it, who should get the credit, who should get the blame, why did it happen, and how? And as they report that information, their own conscious bias comes in. And then, of course, if you just ask the question the right way, well, are you certain that the red car ran the light? Well, I'm certain that the red car went through the intersection. Frankly, I wasn't looking at the red light to see if it was red, green, or yellow, or blinking, or purple. In fact, I was only looking at the red car when it went through the intersection and I saw the collision. Well, you said earlier you felt like the white car was at fault. Well, but I, I saw the red car go through the intersection and the white car hit it. But was the red car supposed to be in the intersection? I don't know. I wasn't looking at the light. So are you changing your story? No, I'm telling you what I saw, but perception of those facts, those are different, right? Here's what I know also, though. If there's only one side of the story told, if, if that was the only eyewitness and no one else said, no, I, I was looking at the lights because I was waiting for the walk light. And I know that from the direction I was walking, which was the same direction as that car was traveling, that light was green. I know because I was walking and, and I was afraid I was going to hit by that other car when it came flying through the intersection. So now we've established that someone was paying more attention to the lights than the cars, but what about the timing? Do we know? See, these, these are all the questions of history. And you can recall history and validate it, or you can recollect and correct, or you can simply agree with history. But the truth is, history will always be told by the victor. And history will always be told through the lens of the observer. And it will be remembered and recalled and recollected and documented through multiple perspectives. And it's always the one who has the loudest voice or the biggest pen or the most predominant recognition whose history will be remembered. Just think in the very short term. It's only been 31 days. 31 days since the skirmish as we know it right now, the war between Israel and Hamas. 31 days. How did it start? Who started it? Whose fault was it? How did it happen? Who's to receive credit? Who's to receive blame? I bet right now you're personally confused about that particular incident. It's only been 31 days. But I know for a fact there were people three days after it happened, the day that it was happening, pointing blame and delivering stories and sharing information that they knew to be false at the time that they said it. It's not the first time. I, maybe you've seen Wag the Dog. It's a pretty old film, but it was really about the idea of how do we use a news story to change someone else's attention? How do we, how do we get them to not look over there and to start looking over there? Well, the Four Minute Men did it. The 100,000 stories that are being gathered by this organization, very similar to mine, but they have a particular lens through which they look at the world. You can tell because of who's in their corner, so to speak. When you know who's in their corner, you have a pretty good idea what their view of the world is. Who's right, who's wrong, whose side they're going to take up front, what kind of stories they would gather, who they would ask the questions to. And when you think about life through that perspective, you realize as a leader, every story you tell kind of sets up the expectation of what history was. It'll either validate it or correct it. Every story that you tell will then move that information from what was historical into what is today. What's now? How do we act with this information now? What do we do now if that's true? But then coming from the other side, we also have to remember that we are currently writing the future. And everything that we tell about our history, everything we explain about our now, all of those details will plan 
predict, prepare, and in some ways predetermine the future for many generations to come. What really happened in World War I? Who was to blame? Who was responsible? Why did it happen? What about World War II? Who was to blame? Why did it happen? Was it just the Germans? Was it the Germans and the Russians? What about the Chinese? What about the Japanese? You know, it wasn't Germans who attacked Pearl Harbor. But it was the Japanese that got us into World War II, and the Germans were the ones we ended up fighting most of the time after, after the Japanese. Uh, but we fought all over. We had, we had war fighters in Northern Africa. We had war fighters all over Asia. We had war fighters at the, what's it, 48th parallel? We had war fighters everywhere, in the oceans, and all because of an attack on Pearl Harbor done by the Japanese in a war started by the Germans, right? Well, I guess it just depends on whose history you read. Because we know history tends to repeat itself. The question is why? Is it one giant agenda that just keeps coming up and we have to have wars to fight it down? It does seem like the war concept never comes to a close, doesn't it? We fight wars to gain peace, and yet we just keep fighting. And when there's not a war, it seems like there's someone there to stir up our current history, our everyday life, into creating one. They want the division. They want the strife. They want the problem between us because war is good for business. That's a sad truth. But so is illness. Being sick is good for the business of the pharmaceuticals. Being dead is, well... That's good business for the cemeteries and the people who make the boxes they put you in and the stones that they put over your head when you're gone. There's business for everything. As a leader, you're going to have to choose the stories that you tell. You're also going to have to be certain that you tell the story as you see it, as you witnessed it, as you experienced it. I'm telling you right now, there's a, there's a phrase that we hear it sometimes, but I have a feeling in, in near future, we're going to hear it a whole lot more. It hasn't always been like that. It hasn't always been like this. What we're experiencing right now, God willing, is temporary. It will get better. But if we as leaders are not willing to tell the stories of the things that we've lived through, how did we survive? How did we make it out? How did we get past it? Then the stories of the specialists, the propagandists, the influencers who have a mandate from somewhere to continue to carry a thread of a story, an idea, a notion. They've only got to carry it so far. I'll give you one example. In, in the world of my own personal concerns, I am a fan of the Dallas Cowboys. In the most recent Sunday of this podcast, the Dallas Cowboys played the Philadelphia Eagles. In that game, the Cowboys crossed the finish line, the goal line, four times before they were credited with one touchdown. And part of the reason was a series of penalties. One of those penalties that was a very clear violation of the rules if a specific condition wasn't met also was a very clear recalling of a very clear touchdown. change the outcome of the game. A win or a loss could be determined by that penalty, that decision. Now, it turns out that the condition that made that a penalty had actually been met, and so it wasn't a penalty. But it's history now. What are you going to do about it? You can't unchange the scoreboard. You can't overrule the game, but, but it didn't just happen once in that game. It happened multiple times in that game. There was another one where a penalty wasn't called. And had the penalty been called, it would have changed the outcome of that play, which very well could have changed the outcome of that game. Instead, a touchdown that everyone thought was a touchdown became a non-touchdown, which became a turnover of the ball, which became another factor in the losing of the game. Now, I'm not here to complain about the refs. All I'm saying is the perspective that you have of what actually happened versus what did happen is sometimes clouded. You'll notice sometimes when you watch these games, baseball, football, high school, college, doesn't matter. The game is being recorded on multiple cameras from multiple angles. And sometimes when you're watching it live, you see something happen. You're like, wow, that should have been a penalty. 
But when the replay comes, the replay booth, the upstairs people, the, the regular keepers of history, they never, they never replay that angle on broadcast for you to see. See, I know right now there are three different cameras recording what I'm doing. I have this one, which sees me, and this one, which doesn't see me. I have to actually move to get in the frame. What does that tell me? It tells me that in everything in life, there are different perspectives and different angles and different ways of seeing things. And if you, as you're living your life as a leader, are only looking through the one lens that's being broadcast to you, chances are you're not seeing every angle. And as a leader, you're responsible for an angle or two. And a week from now, a month from now, a year from now, five years from now, a decade from now, a generation from now, the things that you personally live through and never told anybody about could be the difference in winning and losing, could be the difference between freedom and tyranny. Because you have lived through some things and your perspective, your ideas, your recollection could change the outcome of the game. If you as a leader are concerned about whether or not you tell those stories well, look me up. My job is to help leaders tell better stories better. In large part, that has to do with the stories you're telling inside your own head. Those stories, they will directly impact your income, your success, your relationships, your mental health, your physical well-being, just the stories that never get out of your mouth. Just the stories that are being told in your head. Yeah, they impact your DNA, your heart rate, your blood pressure, the hormones coursing through your body, your stress, your strain, your inflammation, tumors. You don't believe me? Read Dr. Caroline Leaf, Bruce Lipton, Joe Dispenza, uh, Robert Caldini. Read any of them. Uh, Dr. Daniel Amen. All of them will tell you that what's going on in your subconscious mind, the stories you're telling yourself have a direct impact on your well-being physically, emotionally, and mentally. But even more than that, the stories that you tell verbally, the stories that you write out, the stories that you share on your social media, the stories you tell around the boardroom, around the water cooler, around the dining table, around the Christmas tree, around the Thanksgiving turkey, around the fire pit, those stories, will shape the opinions and ideas of the people who have allowed you into their life as an influence. And your ability to grasp and articulate those stories, to not just see the story in the right light, in a proper light, in a good light, but to be able to articulate it in a way that's interesting. See, these 75,000 volunteers of the Four Minute Men, these people who would stand up in the theater and deliver the pre-written propaganda, they were artists. They were articulate. They were poetic. They were engaging. They learned to tell stories better, whether the stories they told were true or not. Here's another irony, though. If you look at your calendar well enough, you'll realize that around the same time was born a class by a man who said, I'm not really wanting to train public speakers as much as I want to train people to be better people. And the best way to do that is to become better communicators. And better communicators who are better people, they can change the world. His class was founded in 1919, I believe. Dale Carnegie was his name. The Dale Carnegie course, now known as the Strictly Business course, will change the way you communicate with people, but it also changed the who that you are. And a large portion of what I do to tell better stories better is anchored in the five years I spent coaching the Dale Carnegie program and the last 12 that I've spent as a coach of the John Maxwell program. Two men that I realize have shaped the world that I live in and a lot of you as well. The stories that you tell, they will recall and validate history or they will recollect and correct history. They will motivate what we do right now and next, they will also inform and decide the future for generations to come. I challenge you to be a part of history and tell your story. Tell better stories better. I'm Jay Lauren Norris with Leading Leaders Podcast for Tell It Like It Is TV. Have a blessed day.
Lauren is a master teacher on storytelling, and I learned so much. Um, I'm really going to have to sit down and go back through everything, and I think I might have to have some more coffees with Lauren, but uh, it was totally worth my time, and I really highly recommend it if you're looking to grow your ministry, grow your business, uh, grow your career. Uh, Lauren will serve you well. Thank you.